Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show and a very happy new year to you all. Yes, happy new year. But before we bid a final fond farewell to 2021, we thought we'd take a, a look at some of the show highlights from a turbulent year. COVID still dominated in 2021, and this show fielded leading international expertise to help understand the most serious pandemic for 100 years. They're protecting young people from something with a risk profile that's sort of the same frequency as the side effects of the vaccine. But the wider protection isn't being taken into account. So I think it's a difficult decision. I can see why they've made it, but I would personally have supported encouraging anyone who's 12 and up getting a jab because I think it will contribute to our ability long term to control the virus. The team working element of the NHS in Scotland has been very, very powerful over the past few years. It's important that we continue that, that kind of approach as we, as we roll out vaccination and allow, I mean, I'm hearing stories of people being told to throw away unused vaccine rather than find somebody to give it to. You know, you're not allowed to give it to someone who's not in tier X or whatever. That's just nuts. We need to, we need to trust frontline staff to, to do the right thing with it. And for Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Sajid Javid, to lay a lot of singular, singular emphasis on boosters, boosters, boosters is a smokescreen. The important way of managing case numbers will be as follows. It is multi-layered. It has to be multi-layered. So you have to immunize people who have not yet been immunized. You have to uh, give the boosters to the vulnerable people. And furthermore, you have to also address other issues. The other issues are equally important. The other issues being wear your mask, wear it properly, wear it in crowded places, wear it on buses, tubes, trains, and crowded supermarkets. Furthermore, the big elephant in the room that we are not addressing, and this is extremely serious, is the seasonal influenza vaccines. We need to suppress influenza very much so this year. So it's a multi-pronged approach, multiple layers, as well as please attend to seasonal influenza immunization urgently. So what's the, uh, our scorecard? Our scorecard is we've been able to prove that 10 or actually now 13 vaccines are safe and efficacious by different regulatory standards, but by and large, that's the answer. So that was relatively simple. We did it in, in record time, starting from scratch uh, at, at, in January, 2020, getting to vaccines approved by November of 2020. Great. The bigger questions though, aren't around vaccine research and development but really around can we make enough of this vaccine in order to vaccinate 8 billion people around the world? And then can we distribute the vaccine? Do we have the logistical system in place that will be able to put jabs into the arms of those 8 billion people? And, and those are going to be far more pressing questions this year and next year. Now, it mean, what struck me about these scientists, doctors that we had on, what excellent communicators they become. I mean, they really explain things. Uh, certainly the ones we had on, they explain things very well. And at the end of the day, the public are always after as much detailed information as they can get to help them through, obviously, the worst crisis that, that all of us have seen in our lifetime. So I think there's a general appreciation of having people on for a period of time to explain the situation I at length. That was very important. But COVID dominated the headlines, but international power politics was also back with a vengeance in 2021. A new president was faced with the end game in Afghanistan, the most inglorious, ignominious American foreign policy retreat since Vietnam. Colonel Lawrence Wilkinson was the late General Colin Powell's chief of staff. He described for us how America entered the 20 year long war on terror. While anthropologists, uh, Professor Wade Davis and Professor Akbar Ahmed, explained what the flight from Kabul tells us about the future. The moment we selected the war instrument, we elevated Al-Qaeda and its like to warrior status. We even had extraordinary difficulty coming up with a term to describe them so that Geneva Conventions and other things wouldn't apply to them. Um, we lost, and we understandably lost, I think, because as President Bush himself told a group of evangelicals visiting the White House, my rage is up. Please help me. Help me restrain my rage. I think that was the most telling comment the then young neophyte, inexperienced president made. 
Um, it was all about revenge and secondarily about preventing a second attack. And we thought if we went after the head of the snake, we would prevent a second attack better. Um, but it was uh, an ill-informed decision to decide to use military power. We now are bathed in the Madisonian warning of when you give the executive unlimited war powers, you are on a dangerous track, a very dangerous track. Um, and we're paying for it. And Afghanistan is just one of the debts we owe. Obviously, somebody had to pull a plug on that on that the, that that war. It couldn't go on forever, for God's sake. On the other hand, you know, the, as the famous saying by Harry Truman, the buck stops here. And whether he likes it or not, those images from Kabul, like the images in 1975 in Saigon, which incidentally, it was interesting how the administration immediately went to those images with this incredible uh, and, uh, you know, methinks a man protests is too much refusal to draw any kind of parallels to what happened in Saigon in 1975. But anyone with the eyes to see could see on the video cameras, and I mean, on the, on the television monitor, that it was exactly like Saigon in 1975. I mean, it was utterly parallel. You know, we, we left in 1975, Nixon having spent billions of dollars to arm the South Vietnamese army. It was called the, Vietnam, the, the Vietnamization of the Amer Vietnam War. The whole idea that Nixon's can, you know, strategy was to get the American boys uh, out of the coffins and back home. Uh, and and we could we could just use money and power and arms to equip uh, an army that in the end had no will whatsoever to fight and had had just rampant corruption from the level of the, of the field up into the presidential palace. Well, surely that's exactly what we saw in Afghanistan. But I also pointed out that when you urinate on dead bodies in Afghanistan or flush the Quran down the toilet, uh, that is going to upset not only the Taliban, but all Muslims, and that create problems. Uh, people did uh, pick that up, and recently, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, who's considered uh, one of the leading, or perhaps the leading American public intellectual, uh, again talked of the thistle and the, and the drone and said this, that this is the book that should be read now, after the fall of Kabul, because we'll make the same mistakes again and again. But all conflicts have a human side. And to understand it better, we turn to Yvonne Ridley, a woman once held captive by the Taliban, and Hamas Kohistani, an Afghan refugee who has gone to great success in the UK. Don't walk away. The last time you walked away, you isolated the Taliban on the international stage and Afghanistan became a playground for every wannabe jihadi. So don't walk away, it won't work. However, uh, if you're going to come back, arm yourselves this time with aid, with practical help, with uh, selfless motivation. I'm not sure the West can do that, but um, you know that country needs an army of teachers. Uh, they've just had a brain drain. Uh, they, they need doctors, um, professionals who can help rebuild the country. And the West, this time, can try nation building without weapons. Because I feel like Afghan women are so oppressed and they're painted as these, I mean, they're, not, they're just dehumanized. You know, lives are getting lost left, right and center, children and women and girls with what's happening right now. They're, they're just, you know, they're seen as numbers, as these blue ghosts with the burqas. That's all Afghan women are known as uh, in the world. So I just wanted to show the world that, no, we're, we're also capable. We're just as good as anyone else. It was so lovely to see Hamas, a wonderful success story uh, for the country, a young woman of colour who's done so well after coming over from, from such difficult times. It was interesting, I mean, there were the two women, quite different, uh, but whose lives were touched by Afghanistan, were both with compelling stories. Absolutely. In 2021, the political conference season was back. Who better to survey the political landscape than the Dwaya in the political commentary, Professor Sir John Curtis? and two experienced political hands who disagree on just about everything. Former Labour MP Chris Williamson and former Tory minister Edwina Curry. The fact that Brexit still structures uh, who, how people are going to vote so much gives the Conservatives a very considerable advantage. In contrast, the Remain vote 
is still divided between Labour, to some degree the Liberal Democrats, and north of the border, the SNP. So that legacy of Brexit, which, um, albeit it's not in the headlines, is still very heavily structuring party choice. And because on the Remain side, the vote is fragmented, and on the Leave side, it's relatively concentrated. That's giving the Conservatives a ballast that means it's proven very, very difficult for Labour to get the Conservatives below 40% of the vote. A lot of people are frightened now, it seems to me, to speak their mind in Sir Keir Starmer's Labour Party. And, uh, you know, we're seeing the, you know, the propaganda building up, the anti-China propaganda building up. We should be seeing the opposition speaking out about and, and opposing. And what we should be arguing for is a huge investment in our public services. We have our own sovereign currency. Money is no object in this country. We have lots of spare capacity. The only kind of inflationary uh, pressures that are generated is when you spend, the government spends beyond, uh, or any entity in the, in, in the economy for that matter, beyond the capacity to absorb it. And to see this latest nonsense, this AUKUS so-called, this deal between Australia, the UK and the US, is uh, just another example, it seems to me, of, of how out of touch our political leaders are. They're not dealing with the real issues, the real problems that are confronting everyday people. It's only five years since David Cameron was falling over himself to cuddle up to the, the Chinese and, of course, Hinkley Point, a massive investment in Chinese nuclear technology while we're simultaneously exporting nuclear technology to, to Australia with China as the, uh, as the target. Well, what's going on, Edwina Curry? Oh, the French were very, very upset about it, not least because they had the clue. They really didn't know anything about it. Um, and I feel a bit sorry for them because they've lost this huge uh, uh, project, this uh, enormous order for many billions uh, of euros worth of diesel-powered engines. Ah, uh, the French, the traditional enemy. <laughs> Uh, and what AUKUS is going to do is enable them to have what lots of other countries, including France, have, which is nuclear-powered submarines. You know, Taz, it would have been fantastic if we'd been able to have that pair in the studio together. Yeah, we could have recreated the adversarial scene right here for everybody to see. But I was interested in one of the new female voices in the House of Lords, Baroness Claire Fox. If anyone can upset musty convention, then Claire Fox certainly can. Well, the irony is, I think, that Corbynism did have a base. I might not have agreed with it. I might have thought its base was limited, but it gave a certain enthusiasm to a particular group of people around, you know, what passes for left-wing politics. I mean, I'd be very critical of it. I think a lot of it was anodyne and superficial, but I understood it enthused people. You know, he did have big rallies, that's true. Keir Starmer, what does he offer? You know, he supported the Corbyn project, but was a bit lacklustre. He was very much associated with the Remain camp, which, as I say, is not going to play well. And then he comes in and it's not clear what he stands for other than not being Corbyn. They could have found a way of being a different party, but they didn't. And I, I, I think it's gone. That's the, the main thing I'm saying is, if Labour is finished in Scotland, and I think that the lesson is that Labour, when I used to have mates in Scotland spend every summer there, the Labour Party were the dominant party. I could never imagine in those days that there would be anything other than Labour domination. And now look at them, and I think that the lesson is, is that once that slippery slope starts in quite as dramatic a way, then I can't see how they can recover. I think what's interesting about Claire Fox, often in interviews she comes across as quite competitive, uh, but in that one-to-one -one interview, it was really a warm personality in theirs. and of course quite a deep political thinker. I mean, the Battle of Ideas Festival has been partly her idea. As she said herself, we were discussing before the shoot that, you know, when you're just given 30 seconds or a minute for a sign it's quite difficult to get your personality across. And at the end of the day, people do want to understand what politicians are all about. But join us after the break when we look at some of the show business highlights from our 2021 shows. We will see you then. Welcome back. The economics of the pandemic will occupy textbooks for many years to come. But all of us are living through the experience. We look for explanation from one end of the world to the other, from Professor Danny Blanchflower and Dr Richard Mead. 
I think there is a genuine issue um, for the countries that have allowed the virus to become more endemic, that even if the mortality rate is falling because the vaccination rates are, are, are taking off, we should be very mindful of the fact that um, there's more than one way to create an economic cost from the pandemic. And uh, chronic illness, um, if that's debilitating and it's stopping people from living their normal lives and working their normal jobs, et cetera, that's actually a very costly thing. And so if we think about uh, the overall economic cost of the pandemic, um, we can think about the human cost and loss of life and the, the GDP impacts of whatever measure we put in place to try and stop the, the virus from spreading. Um, but we do need to be very mindful also of these other enduring possible health consequences. I think the, the economic implications are that people are worried and scared, especially the young. And in the United States, in the southern states, this is this is a big worry. So we've seen we've seen a, a divide coming. The world has now got two groups of people, not Republicans and Democrats, Tories and Labour. We've got the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And we've never seen anything like that. So there we have it from the United States all the way down to New Zealand. But of course, Alex, you're an economist. You must have a view on the on the long term impact of COVID globally. Well, Dan Blas for a good friend and a very, very prominent economist. Uh, but Dr. Richard Bead, I'd never met before, but really interesting work on the long-term impact, as you say, of long COVID. I mean, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes once said, in the long run, we're all dead, famously. <laughs> well, hopefully, in the long term, we're not going to be dead from COVID, but nonetheless, the long-term economic effects are going to be with us for many years to come. Mm. It wasn't just economics and business, but show business, which kicked back into life in 2021. One of the new online shows which prospered during lockdown was Wonderbirds. On a warm summer day, these were the times. We took a trip to the iconic Pinewood Studios to find out why. Can I just say, women are so good at recognising each other. It's a perfect example in front of us and appreciating each other and what they have to offer. Do you get the same from, from men in show business? Do you? I mean, your, your mum and dad, of course, the creators of, of, so, That's creators right. of so many things. Who, who, who got the fame out of it all? Oh, my dad, definitely. Um, my mother was actually the creative entity. She was the one who came up with all the storylines. Um, she built the characters, she created all the characters, and she wrote most of the scripts. And, and yet my father um, actually got all the credit, which isn't fair, is it? So, so now, you know, um, people do say to me about, oh, it's great, you know, that, that, to meet your dad and to, to know your dad. But actually, it was my mum who did everything. And in those days, it was always the guy yeah. that got his name above the title. And it's still, it hasn't changed that much, really. And it's only people like yourself, Alex, who, you know, you really support women. Of course, Taz um, goes without saying. But, you know, and it, it, it has been difficult for us. And I think we should do more to get, you know, women centre stage in the industry. It was so lovely to see Debbie, Dee and Linda in person because obviously we've done online interviews uh, with certainly two of them before and Linda's just finished a great pantomime run. I think uh, she enjoyed being a wicked witch in that and of course Dee, as you know, is, is busy trying to get justice for her mum Sylvia who requires recognition as women in show business should get for all the work she did on Thunderbirds but it was wonderful to have such great women. And what well, fun to, to meet them at Pinewood Studios, the iconic Pinewood That's where they filmed all the, the Bond films. You know, I got the feeling so short and Connery was there. <laughs> yes, they're in spirit, no doubt. God bless his soul. Now, Wonderbirds is a new online show, but the biggest blockbuster on TV now is Succession, starring Dundee-born Brian Cox as a profane, taciturn patriarch, Dundee-born Logan Roy. He spoke to Alex about acting, life and politics. You know, I'm a socialist. I believe in egalitarianism. I believe that we're all, as they say in Scotland, we're all Jock Tamsin's bairns and we all need that equal opportunity. Unfortunately, some people are more equal than others, and that's what's happened, and it's happened in the theatre, and I think it's really sad. Well, as you know, Alex, I love Succession. I've been <laughs> still enjoying watching it, but Ryan says something really important here about Jock Tamsin's parents. I mean, as a, as a mixed-race person, as a woman of colour, I know how much it means to people who've made Scotland the home wherever they've come from. To have that phrase attributed to them, we're all Jock Tamsin's parents. It's, it's a lovely phrase. Yeah, but Brian's a, a deep political thinker, but uh, the, I thought the, the funniest story he told us was 
because Logan Roy is famously expletive deletive uh, to everybody, uh, that people come up to Brian because <laughs> he's such a superstar asking for selfies and wanting Brian to swear at them as Logan Roy. And I've got this image in my mind of, of people rushing up to Brian Cox and asking to be sworn. Uh, but knowing Brian, he probably does it, uh, goes ahead and does it anyway, but that's, that's just well, Brian Well, he does Cox. it in good heart, I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, the future of Scotland is an abiding interest of this show. In 2021, we, we turn to history and historical fiction for an insight into whether Scotland stands where it did. Well, the Enlightenment era, Edinburgh, is a fascinating chapter in history, and it's not taught in schools enough, I don't think. When I went to school, we did the Industrial Revolution, and to me that was a bit, you know, it was kind of boring to me, all about farming implements and innovations in agriculture. We should have been learning about the Scottish Enlightenment. What a fascinating chapter in history that was. Actually, Alex, you remind me of one of these characters, and I mean that in a, in a nice way, because... It was a time of a lot of visionaries, progressive thinkers. It was a time when even the judges and the lawyers were philosophers and passionately concerned with justice. I think, as you yourself said, when uh, you were first minister, that it would be fantastic to have Thomas Muir and the other radicals, which would mean the radicals of the 1820s as well, written into the, uh, the, the, the curriculum. At the present time, a peaceful time largely, the very fact that Northern Ireland itself is being used as a political football means that with them, as with the Scottish nationalists, the proof of English incompetence, that is actually much more valuable than, shall we say, a nationalist stream which kept on talking about grievances and how badly people are treated. The simple statement that the union is no longer fit for purpose, that seems to be the case as far as Britain is concerned. All fascinating stuff, and I have to take this opportunity uh, to thank Andrew McLeod's wife, Amber, for sending me a beautiful necklace, which I've worn on the show and I will definitely wear again. So thanks very much to Amber. Well, that, that was quite a contrast with, with these guys. We did historical fiction, the historian, and also about the 1820 rising. So, <laughs> so it, what, what we can say is that history, in one way or another in Scotland, is alive, well and kicking. <laughs> it certainly is. And Scotland was in the news in November as COP26 decided the future of the planet and indeed whether there will be one. We spoke to top scientists to set the scene. Alex Sharma, the chair of the COP, UK chair of the COP, had laid out four things before people assembled in Glasgow. One was to come with better pledges to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from different countries. That was not a success. And so that is a problem, a major problem for the world in that before the COP, the world was heading for about three and a half degrees of global warming by uh, the end of the century. And we're still now heading for 2.7 degrees of global warming. So there was some progress, but nothing like enough. So that's got to improve in the next COP and the COP after that. Let's just say you are in Glasgow next week. Where would you rather be? Would you, you want to be outside the conference hall giving these world leaders a piece of your mind? Or alternatively, would you like to be inside giving them a, a few solutions? Well, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be outside because that, I think, is where things are going to happen. Inside, it's very important that we have this political process, this, this legislative process, getting things right. But then... What follows on from that is we've got to act on the commitments. Well, here's a, a wee forecast for the new year. This issue of carbon capture, the ability to take carbon dioxide back and store it in the saline aquifers of the North Sea or otherwise, that's going to be a big issue in this coming year. No doubt something we're going to have to feature again on the show as well. Now, we return to location forming this year as well. My favourite outside broadcast was from Wembley Way, previewing the showdown between England and Scotland in the Euro Championships. Who knows? With both teams going well in qualification, perhaps there'll be a replay at this year's Qatari World Cup. But behind the tournament, the issue of racism in sport was never far from this year's headlines. For an important reflection on the subject, Alex turned to England legend John Barnes. It's very easy to point the finger at a fan who throws a banana on the field or who abuses you on Twitter. However, real is that real racism, as I like to call it, is a, a, the majority of it you can't see. 
it's, it's obvious the overt racism, the bananas and the, and the Twitter. But of course, when you look at the fact that there are 30% black footballers and they are probably less than 2% black managers, as much as black managers aren't being racially abused, the fact is that they're not being given opportunities. So why don't we speak about that? And that's, that for me is a bigger problem. It is very disappointing to think that there is a, a still a lot of problems with, virtually, as you said, overt racism. Don't get me wrong, I, I do believe the, the knee has come, uh, will become slightly symbolic. It's fantastic that um, not only uh, your teammates, but your opponents are being empathetic with the, your situation and so forth. I think now it's time to maybe do a bit more action, if you like, and uh, do things that, and make sure it doesn't keep happening as, as it has done for many years. It was really good to hear from both John and Mark with some real life stories of what faced the sports people and indeed hit many in society at the sharp end of, of racism. And I, I hope that their knowledge, wisdom and their standing will allow them to, to demonstrate why things must get better. Well, they were enormous stars of the, of the 1980s. And it's worth remembering that both these players in Scotland and England faced bananas being thrown at them regularly on the pitch. It's extraordinary when you think about it. And, that they could talk about it in such an intelligent way is remarkable. Incidentally, John Barnes, I should say, was manager of Celtic for a brief period, <laughs> but as he was keen to point out to me, statistically at least, a very successful one. <laughs> of course, you've got an interest in Celtic being a heart supporter indeed, have you not, Alex? So that was the year that was, and now it's time to take down our Christmas tree and look to what's coming up next year, Alex. Well, I, I suspect COVID will be ever with us. Across the Atlantic, the, the question is, can Biden and Harris escape their political woes or are they really vulnerable to a Trumpian comeback? And at home, will a challenge from Scotland finally emerge to cause Boris Johnson some sleepless afternoons? I suspect so. Well, whatever 2022 offers, from all of us here at the show, our crew, the whole team, we would like to wish you all a happy and prosperous new year. Yes, as we say in Scotland, have a good new year. And we hope to see you all again next week. Until then, bye-bye for now.